get down, get down! They're known as the door kickers of the world. And here at an exercise in Tampa, Florida, in the United States, a multinational cohort including American, Norwegian, Dutch and Estonian special operations forces show off what they're famous for, rapid surgical strikes to take out an enemy. But special operations forces trade to operate in remote, hostile environments, often in small numbers or even alone, can provide a lot more than brute force, according to experts. I would say less than 10% of our operations are kinetic. And, and that's a good thing, but you never hear about that. What you hear about always is the ones that, that do go high end and high order. I mean, it's what makes movies. I mean, nobody wants to see you out there spending eight or nine months living in a quartel, with, you know, doing, you know, teaching people how to do basic infantry tactics and stuff. You know, it's just, that's not sexy. I mean, you know, Bruce Willis won't star in that movie. Over a decade of counterinsurgency operations in Afghanistan and Iraq have given allied country special operations forces long experience in working with partners, training up their own indigenous military services. The ability to interoperate um, with partners um, has been uh, a key lesson that will carry forward into the future. And that's, that's common language, common tactics, techniques and procedures. Uh, and an understanding of common effort and strategy. Interoperability is a buzzword, but its significance is greater than mere jargon. Today's global security threats, including a dispersed Al-Qaeda network over multiple continents, require a different model to the large long-term deployment of troops. You know, every nation can afford to have 500 to whatever well-trained, well-equipped, mature forces that have the capabilities they need to move quickly, and I mean, we're talking hours, not days or weeks or months, um, that they can operate in an uncertain or often hostile environment. At a recent conference, Special Forces operators had the chance to look at emerging technology, like drone aircraft, cyber intelligence, or even gadgets that could make operators' life in the field a little easier. A is a unique technology. It's stable when it's rolled, and then when it starts to deploy, it takes on a life of its own and then self-deploys to create a structure which is also load-bearing. Load uh, some of the big benefits is that we can work in areas where you don't want a person in. We can stop, we can loiter, we can come around the building and look from the other side. It doesn't get tired like a person does. So right now we have, we have um, soldiers that go out every night and they, and they work in a, in a uh, dangerous environment. Um, and, and we really think that if we had more protection, we wouldn't uh, lose those, those gentlemen. And an exoskeleton is one of the ideas uh, that we may end up using. But the first truth for Special Operations Forces is humans over hardware, something which a strong alliance can build on. Now these efforts are really, t in modern day, about the human domain. Uh, and I, th I think we continue to learn that uh, in Afghanistan and, and we're watching that in the Ukraine as one example. I think this is a role for NATO special operations as a collective that we can provide and be successful in. The decision makers here say that returning special operations forces to a pre-9-11 role, undermanned and reactive to crises, not proactive, is unthinkable. But it will take long-term and resolute global partnership to maintain the high-level skills of these operators. Ruth Owen in the United States for NATO Channel.